Good day, fellow investors. We are finally seeing some volatility in the markets. And according to Bloomberg's yesterday's headline, there are some darkening clouds coming over the markets and the anxiety is rising. However, today on Friday, I'm filming this Friday morning, so but I think the stock market will go or be stable or go up on Friday, even if terrible news from China came with the economy slowing down, but the government will intervene. So that has balanced out markets. Nevertheless, the market is even higher over this week, but the volatility has increased a bit and the market is still three point something, four points higher over the year. So still very, very positive. But in last week's video on stock market news, I explained how stocks are risky, are expensive from a long term perspective. In the view news before that, I explained how there will be a crash. But today I want to discuss what are the driving forces of the market? What drives stocks to go up, stocks to go down? What keeps the S&P 500 at these expensive levels? And what might keep it or push it higher or lower? So today we're going to focus on the short term mar market dynamics, the forces that drive the market, the medium term market dynamics and the long term market dynamics a little bit, even if I discussed them last week. And we're going to hear from Jack Bogle, a Vanguard's founder, about what we can expect from stocks from the stock market in the long term at this point in time. So let's start by looking at the short term, then the medium term and the long term perspective on the stock market. It will be an amazing lesson. And at the end of this video, you will know exactly what you have to do in relation to your situation. Should you be in stocks? Should you be in bonds? Should you be in something else? Should you invest differently? Because this content will give you a good perspective on what's going on. What are the risks and rewards in the short, medium and long term? Let's start. The short term impact on stocks when JP Morgan comes out with a report saying that there is a 60% recession in the next two years, then everybody is scared. Oh my God, what happens to the stock market if there is a recession? And that is the short term impact on stocks. That is sentiment because there have been such news for the past 10 years. Italy is wrecking havoc in Europe. Their budget is crazy. Stocks have been declining also in Italy. It is a very tough situation and that might spread around the world. Of course, Chinese stock markets have been heavily, heavily hit again in the last year. And there is really a big, big sentiment play because the margin that holds Chinese stocks is 600 billion under margin of stocks on a 5 trillion market. So every little decline is exacerbated by stock market margin calls, where those who are betting by using debt on stocks have to sell them from their brokers. So that's why the extremely high volatility in China, even if the fundamental economics show 6.5% growth, something to keep in mind and take advantage of the volatility when you are investing in China, but more due diligence is also needed there. On the New York Stock Exchange, the stocks under margin is also 600 billion, but around 600 billion, but the stock market capitalization is more than 30 trillion. The Chinese stock market is 5 trillion. And again, 11, 12% of it is under margin with uh, the New York Stock Exchange, 1.2% is under margin or 2%. So that's a huge difference. And that's why you see the Chinese stock market going up and down like crazy, while the S&P 500 is much more stable. There is not that much margin investing. As you can see here, the China ETF is up only 10% over the next five years, despite the economy doing great, 20% down. So bear market for Chinese stocks since this, uh, the beginning of this year. And we might hit the 2016 lows if we get another month like the past month. Now, also something very important for the sentiment, big banks have started also medium term here, big banks have started reporting their earnings. And most of the gains are from one off items while the operating earnings are not that good, which means the economy is slowing down. Why? There is one big reason for that. And that is the Fed hiking rates and they are now debating as the minutes of their 
meeting came out debating restrictive territory, so really pushing on the brakes to slow down the overheating economy. So a substantial majority of participants expected that the year end 2020 and 2021 federal funds rate would be above their estimates of the longer run rate, which means that when you look at yields, if yields go higher, asset values go lower. Yields, interest rates work like gravity on stocks and other asset prices. So when Fed officials say that they might push interest rates beyond free, let's say to 4%, then everything turns. And those are very big changes. Interest rates were zero for eight, nine years. And now we are talking of interest rates of 4%, which means that the treasury, US government treasury might yield 5%. If that happens, stocks will have dividend yields of 5% and not 2%, which means stocks can fall 40%. And that is creating anxiety over the medium term. So JP Morgan, recession, two years, Fed rising interest rates by 2020. So that's another risk anxiety that will slowly evolve. But if it, it's just a projection, but if it happens, then stocks are really in trouble. If it's combined with a recession, then it's even more trouble. So that's what is driving the market over the medium term. So you will see this short term volatility on sentiment, bam up 1%, down 2%, and that will start increasing. But the long term trend, given what's going on with the Fed, the tightening, given the probability of the recession will be a downward trend probably over the next year, two years. Especially if something else, hap something else happens, which is another medium term driver, we'll, which we'll touch in a moment. This is the longer run Fed summary for their projection for the federal funds rate. It has been constantly declining over the past five years, which means declining expectations for interest rates higher asset prices and we have seen the peak of asset prices of the stock market in January 2018 where their expectation for the long run interest rate was at their bottom. Now it's going up and stocks are suffering. Very interesting chart. What happens when the Fed starts tightening? Over the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 times that the Fed tightened, that the Fed increased rates eight times we had a very, very uh, soon recession. Three times a recession didn't happen. Okay, the roaring 60s, then 1982, that was a short term tightening after a big recession. So we don't count that. 1993, four, tightening, no recession. Okay, that was one out of 10 or out of, or out of eight that was avoided. However, the Fed always tries to tighten before a recession so that they can lose their policies that can lower rates when a recession comes. And that's exactly what they are doing now. So JP Morgan might be really right and the Fed might be increasing rates to lower them later to stimulate the economy later. How the tightening works, we see here the 10 year treasury constant maturity rate is already at above 3%, 3.15. So when you invest in stocks, you should expect at least higher dividends than 3%. The S&P is at 2%. So that's what is putting pressure on the S&P 500. And this creates a special anxiety in the markets because for the past 10 years, stocks have been going only up. And people don't think that stocks can go lower because over the past decade, they have been go going only up, up and up. So why would now stop, stop, stocks stop going up? How it is possible that stocks can go down? Well, it is possible. And that's what creating the unease, the anxiety in people. And that's why you see the higher volatility. Should I sell or should I buy? Because after 10 years, everybody is greedy, greedy, greedy. They just want more. Everybody is high on gains. The Fed is slowing down the inflation in Europe with still monetary loose policies, with still money printing. Inflation is also around two. And in the US, the red line, Inflation is also around two, despite the tightening, despite the increasing uh, interest rate. So the Fed for now is balancing very well and doing a great job. But if you look how those higher interest rates affect the economy, look at the new private housing units authorized by building permits. So housing starts, new housing starts. They have started declining. They peaked in March 2018. 
And of course, higher interest rates are not good for houses, are not good for buying cars, are not good for those who take loans. That's why the banks don't show that great numbers, even if they make more money with higher interest rates. But the economy is still seeing, is feeling now starting to feel the effects of higher interest rates. The Fed is trying to balance that, as we have seen in that chart with recessions, they never managed to balance that correctly and never managed to create a soft landing. So I don't think they will manage to do that now. However, there is something else that drives stocks in the medium term that keeps stocks up and that is high employment. So people work, people have their salaries, wages go a little bit up, everybody has a little bit more money, especially in the late part of the economic cycle. Everybody feels great, everybody is positive, everybody spends, so that's what keeps earnings, sales, and what keeps stocks up. Unemployment, all employees are the highest in the history of the United States, 149 million and 500,000. So there are 150 million workers that get their salaries, perhaps have something extra, and they invest in stocks, of course, because stocks were the best investment over the last 10 years. Of course, you should invest in index funds, index funds, index, index, index funds. And look at BlackRock. They just released their earnings and the total long-term net inflows have been extremely high in 2017 and in the first quarter of 2018 when the S&P 500 peaked, but they are still positive. So there are still funds coming into the market. Everybody is pushing their money into the market, no matter what, into index funds. If we look at their retail investments, net flows, we can see that retail investors are still pushing money into index funds and that the highest push was of course when the market was peaking in January. ETFs of course ETFs are the best investment around now and money still very positive coming into ETFs. However institutional investors are pulling a little bit of money from the index funds and also pulling a little bit of money from their active investment funds but especially from index funds. So we have here those employees, the 150 million workers, retail investors, ETFs investors, they are still putting their money into the stock market, which manages to balance the smart money that sees the recession, that sees higher interest rates, that sees, okay, now I can buy treasuries and get my return and manage my risk. And those guys are already pulling their funds out. If when the retail, when the economy really gets hit, when people starting from getting hired start to get fired, then there will be low, less flows into the market, the retail will be lower, the ETF will be lower, the net flow of funds for, all, for BlackRock will be lower, and then you have real pressure on the stocks. So it's all a medium term, let's say, dynamic that you have to understand. That's why the market doesn't crash 50% in one day. That's why it goes slowly, it goes up and down. And first, what increases is the volatility that we have been finally seeing in 2018. Later, we'll see the dynamic where it will go. For now, it slowly goes down, even if in a volatile manner, especially in emerging markets. And when those employees start selling, when there is more negative sentiment, that all will pile up and we will really see the stock market crash. When will that be? next year, in the next five years, we cannot really know because Trump will try to do something to push stocks higher, attack the Fed, lower interest rates. So there is a lot of short term things that can happen, but the eventual, eventually it will go down because as I said in the last stock market news last Friday, stocks are expensive and that is inevitable to hit the market somewhere. Now, let me give you an indication of what to do that will really help you get perspective on this stock market and on where your investments might lead you and what you can do about it. If we look at the S&P 500, with the risks, with the higher interest rates, with the recession risk, it can easily fall 40 to 50%. Just think, if the market falls 40%, it would be just where it was five years ago. So we are in a 10 year bull market, 
just to where it was five years ago, it's not that terrible, but that would be a 37% drop, which would be huge and which will hit a lot of people. So that's the short term risk reward. It can go really down a lot. Upside, let's hear about the upside from the stock market investor above all, Jack Bogle. What you're expecting in terms of market returns for the equity and bond markets in the next decade? Uh, sure, it hadn't changed from what we talked about last year very much. But there's a reality to the stock market, let's take that first. And the reality is that the fundamental return, the dividend yield plus the earnings growth of companies, drives the long-term return of the stock market. The only thing that gets in the way in the short term is a speculative return. Are people going to pay more for stocks? Are people going to pay less for a dollar of earnings, in, in essence? Right. And if, for example, the price earnings multiple uh, were to go from 10 to 20 uh, that over a, a decade, that would be a 100% increase. That would be 7% added to the return each year. So it can be very substantial, and it also can be negative. If the PE goes from 20 to 10, minus 7% or roughly 7% a year. So um, where are we now? Well, the dividend yield is about 1.8%, less than 2%. I'm looking for future earnings growth of around 5%. I don't think we can do much better than that, maybe a lot better this year uh, with the tax cut, uh, and uh, maybe, maybe a little bit better next year too, but maybe 5%. So let's call the dividend yield 2, and 5 is 7 uh, by my numbers, that's the investment return. 2% right. dividend yield, 5% earnings growth. That's a 7% return. And if the price earnings ratio is to go down a little bit, uh, I think 1.5% off that 7% return, which would be a 5.5% return on stocks over that period. And that's a little higher than I've been using. Uh, maybe right, maybe wrong. I've usually been using about 4 so, as Jack Bogle says, the fundamental earnings plus dividends are the drivers of the stock market return. Everything else is speculation. So, he says, in the long term, 4-5% is what we can expect from stocks, 3-4% is what we can expect from bonds. So, in the balance there, stocks, bonds are much less risky now that stocks, and this will have to let's say, balance itself out. So either stocks will yield 6%, which would be the logical conclusion, which means stocks will have to fall 30-40%. So that's something to keep in mind that, yes, stocks will probably lead to 4-5% over the next two decades to be a little bit more conservative than Bogle. So if you're happy with two decades of waiting for 4%, 3%, returns with possibilities of extremely high volatility, then you should keep to your stocks or balance between stocks and bonds. So that's my first message. Look at what you can personally take as a risk. So don't risk what you need in life for something you don't need in life. That is my first message. Uh, don't risk, uh, I don't know, your safe retirement for another addition to your, I don't know, vacation home, another room or making it closer to the beach. If markets go up another year or two, I can pay for my son's tuition. Don't risk your retirement, your safety net for such, let's say, crazier things because that's crazy. Secondly, enjoy the gains of this stock market. So we have had 10 great years, sometimes, the best thing to do is to really enjoy those gains. Say, okay, I'm done, I made a lot of money, I'm happy with what I have, and it's time to enjoy, to balance things out, to check treasuries, 3% short-term treasuries, which is good for many, many, many people. Think about the risk reward. Message number three, stocks have been going up for 35 years, and that has been great. Will stocks continue to go up in the next 35 years? That's a question you have to answer and you have to see, okay, it might happen, it might not happen. The world might be much different in the next three decades than it was in the past three decades. So am I going to start diversifying my portfolio? Am I going to start look globally? Am I going to start look at protection, gold hedges, 
other kinds of hedges. And that is what I do. I look at stocks globally with higher interest rates, higher yields, higher earnings yields than what Jack Bogle describes with 5%. I'm looking at 10, 12, 15% yields across the world, accepting higher short-term volatility, but I think equal risk as the S&P 500 has at this moment in time. So if you want to see more about this third option, about starting to thinking, okay, what else is out there in the world? Please check my stock market research platform to find perhaps interesting investments across the world. So if you are not such an enterprising investor, my stock market platform might not be for you. If you are a passive investor, tomorrow I'll make a video comparing the S&P 500 index with Berkshire Hathaway, which I think will be a much better investment over the next decade or two than the S&P 500. So tune in tomorrow, subscribe, click that notification bell to get notified when there is a video coming up. Thank you for watching, looking forward to your comments and I'll see you in the next video.